I think it can be it can be really useful for science communication because you know you read a story and maybe you don't realize that you're learning something but yeah. it's being really sneaky and you actually are learning something <laughs> along the way yeah. yeah that's my my favorite types of of science communication the ones that aren't intended it's like the side effect of it is that it's teaching you stuff <laughs> Greetings, fellow explorers, and welcome to the 22nd episode of Geekoscopy 101, the podcast that explores the nexus between science, story, wonder, and philosophy with me, your host, Dr. Janusz Kisten. And today we're exploring the wonders of ecofictology with scientist, author, and YouTuber, Lovis Geyer. All right, welcome to the show, Lovis. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing really well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, when I discovered your channel, I made it a mission <laughs> uh, to, to get you on. I've watched, I think I watched like a yeah, solid like three hours of your of your channel. Oh um, my goodness. It was really good. I really oh. enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Three hours. That's the commitment. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm flattered. So why don't you tell us a bit about yourself uh, in this moment and what you do? Okay. Um... Well, one half of my life is a um, PhD student. I live in Scotland right now and um, I'm working on my PhD in ecological modeling. So I've spent the last three and a half years building a massive model that predicts the dispersal and other movements of organisms in aquatic environments. So mm. I'm a marine biologist by training, so a lot of the applications that I envisage for this model are marine, but they mm. can be freshwater as well. Mm. Um, and you can think about questions such as habitat fragmentation or climate change to see how dispersal rules would would change, would be affected mm. by those um, environmental changes. Um, it's kind of a both for conservation and for kind of sustainable management of fishery stocks, for example. Mm, for sure, so those yeah. are the main kind of directions of research uh, that I'm in. So that's my PhD. So I spend my whole day in front of a computer and I code. Mm, <laughs> I'm, mm. a, I'm a coder. Fun times. And, um, <laughs> and then the other half, kind of since lockdown, uh, my Keep Me Sane project was to start a YouTube channel and talk all about ecofiction. So I discovered the genre called ecofiction and it's been my obsession ever since and kind of how ecofiction can be used as a science communication tool. And uh, yeah, I explore that on my on my YouTube channel in all my <laughs> spare time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's a really good one. Um, so why don't you explain what ecofiction <laughs> is exactly? Sure, yeah. Um, it's not a term that most people have heard of. It's Like I said, it's not a term that I'd heard of more, well, more than a year ago. Mm. Um, basically, ecofiction is fiction where the environment or our relationship with our physical environment, um, nature in general, plays a really important role in the plot. So it doesn't necessarily even have to have humans in it. It can be kind of an anthropomorphic story like Watership Down is all about rabbits, but that counts as ecofiction. You can have hard sci-fi be ecofiction. Um, it's really, it's really broad and um, kind of a flexible boundary definition, which is something that I like about it. And um, I think it can be, it can be really useful for science communication because, you know, you read a story and maybe you don't realize that you're learning something but it's being really sneaky and you actually are learning something along the way. Yeah, yeah. that's my, my favorite types of, of science communication, the ones that aren't intended. It's like the side effect of it is that it's teaching you stuff. But uh, yeah. the main point exactly. is to entertain you and that's what captivates you and keeps your attention, which is really important. Absolutely. And the whole point of, um, of ecofiction is that it, it engages with the reader's emotions. So when you read a book, um, you you feel what's happening in the book, and you engage emotionally, and you can relate to the characters, and you you invest in what's happening. And 
if you can connect emotion with topics such as climate change or conservation, um, land degradation, habitat destruction, all of these topics that a lot of the time are really difficult to engage with. Um, if you can find an emotional way to engage with the reader without overwhelming them, then that can be quite a powerful connection, I think. For sure. Well, my guess from, from watching your stuff is that you were actually setting out to write um, a story and include eco-fiction in it. Is that how you came about the genre and, and what actually made you think about actually writing uh, in this genre or any type of story for that matter? I've been writing since I can remember. I've always been writing stories and I've always wanted to be a writer. Mm. Um, and I was working on a, I've been working on this story for years and I only realized once I discovered ecofiction, I only realized that that's what it was, that I was mm. already re writing ecofiction before even knowing that that was a thing. <laughs> mm. um, so I always wanted to kind of send a message about how precious our relationship with nature is and um, how we have lost some of that connection, I feel, and how important it is that we get it back. And so that's always been something that that I've gravitated towards, not consciously, but subconsciously. And um, my the pipe dream for for this for this work of fiction is to get it published. Hmm. And um, one of the things that they always tell you if you want to get it published is you have to create an author brand and an author platform and you have to gain a following so that you could hmm. do some of the marketing yourself and all these things. So I was actually thinking what I could make my author brand. What did I want my author brand to be? And um, that kind of translated into what do I want readers to think of when they hear, oh, this book is written by Logoskaya. Hmm. And I wanted them to think that this is going to be a book where nature is champion, kind of. And our, you know, it teaches you to to care, to connect emotionally with with nature and take responsibility of, of your role in it as well. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, maybe maybe I'll, I'll create like somewhere where you can find fiction that has nature in it or environmental writing or something like that. And then mm. I just stumbled across eco-fiction. So it just, obviously I was not the first to think about this. Mm. And um, there was a, a whole wealth of, of resources and information already out there um, that, that I just, I just fell in love with it immediately. Mm. <laughs> I was, um, I was so happy to find it. So it was actually, um, as a way to to find an audience for my book, I suppose, for people mm. who would connect with my book, mm. that I found the eco fiction community. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still it's still a work in progress, right? I don't, oh, very much, it? very yeah. much so a work in progress. <laughs> how, I, how, um, how far you off you think you're from completing it? Oh, that's a dangerous question. <laughs> <laughs> so I have been working on it for quite a number of years, and it has gone through several revisions. So this is like mm. the third or fourth version of it and every version is very different from the version before mm. um i probably this year i'll say tentatively this year <laughs> i will finish it in um stages and then we'll see where it goes from there <laughs> that reminds me of uh, of token's work um, i heard a story that he actually rewrote the Lord of the Rings many times and had to like from really? scratch yeah from scratch rewrite it because apparently like he wrote himself into a corner many times uh, probably uh. With, with continuity and stuff like that and so he just sat down from scratch rewrote it until the whole story made sense and of course it got better over time and things like that so I well suppose. that's the the plight of the pants or <laughs> people who fly by the seat of their pants and don't uh, plot anything out I suppose, so, yeah, yeah. I, I am, I am a one hundred percent plotter. I plot everything before I write, <laughs> and even then, I'll have it ideas that completely out. change yeah, the story. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, it's, it's a probably a spider web of things you have to to put together ahead of time. How do you do that? Like, do you yeah, use it like an Excel spreadsheet? Or, 
uh, do you have like world building guides or is it just like notepads everywhere? How do you like plan uh, out a book? Well, I, I actually do have an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> this is a, that's how intense my plotting is. So I have a list of all my chapters and my scenes and um, how complete they are so that I have a little progress bar at the bottom to tell me how long, mm. of, how far along I am. Um, which uh, is, is maybe maybe too far along. I don't the, think so. Uh, that sounds fine. The uh, plotting yeah. spectrum, but um, yeah. So I use that, and I also have a, a big um, kind of world building bible that I keep all of the details of my world because I write eco fantasy, so mm -hmm. it's not based in the real world. It's a secondary world mm -hmm. fantasy. I've made it up, <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still trying to send ecological messages, even if the setting is not real world. You can still, you know, the reader's mind will make parallels anyway. Um, and fantasy has always been used as commentary on um, what's happening in our world. And um, yeah, so I have a lot of world building details that I write out culture and ecology and customs and food and <laughs> all of mm. these things <laughs> mm. Mm. for sure um when you came across eco fiction because you found a way to define it how did it change your actual writing or did it change in any way it did yeah it did change it it made it actually helped me massively because um it gave me a direction i suppose so i had been writing eco fiction but i didn't know what that's what it was and then when I kind of diagnosed it um, I knew that those were the messages that I needed to make really clear and those were the things I wanted everything else to kind of um, emphasize so I changed my magic system to be mm. you know very I don't know e ecologically sound and e ecology based and mm. um, and I I developed the industry of the society that I built a little bit more to highlight destructive industrial processes. And I made that kind of the spark that sets off um, the rest of the plot of the story. So it did change it massively, actually. Um, mm. Kind of having a focus of which messages I really wanted to, wanted to come across to the reader. When you were dealing with your whole branding and marketing thing, you decided to... Uh, make a YouTube channel and make videos. Um, why did you choose that specific platform instead of others? Well, yeah, it was it was actually a big step for me because I'm I'm inherently quite a, a shy person. Mm. <laughs> so sitting in front of a camera was terrifying to me the first time, the first few times actually. Yeah. But um, originally, I wanted to write a blog, and then um, I was thinking about it and. Um, I just, I knew that there was already um, dragonfly.eco, which is Mary Woodbury's kind of um, compendium of eco fiction. Mm. It's an amazing resource. It has so many author interviews on it and articles and books, and it has a database. It's, it's wonderful. And I knew that I could not create a blog that would compete with Mary's. And hers had already been running for, oh God, I think it's eight years. Ooh. I'm sorry if I got that wrong, but um, it's been running for a long time. So it's already an established place for people mm. to go to, to find these resources. So I, I kind of knew I needed to exploit a different communication method. And um, actually, a friend of mine was just starting up a YouTube channel and I was like, oh, well, maybe I can do that. Um, it was terrifying, but um, I thought I could I could potentially do it. And there were a lot of authors that I that I followed on YouTube that had created a following that way. So I knew that I, there were, there were niches that I could tap into to mm. kind of accomplish what I wanted. Um, and it's, it's going, it's gone really well, actually, better than I expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, I, I like the whole way that it's set up. It's very, uh, I suppose, booktuber -y. I think that's what the term is. Um, yeah, and I used to follow. Yeah, it some... started out as BookTube mm -hmm. yeah. for book reviews and and yeah. um, talks about genre and things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I, I used to follow some BookTubers back in the day. Um, you know, kind of 
I don't know because I, you have to read so much for for academia. I think my love for reading and reading novels kind of declined, and I started listening to audio books. But then it's usually like self help stuff and like self growth type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I actually haven't read fiction in a long, long while. It's it's kind of sad to say out loud. Uh, but much of my younger days, I suppose, what made me as a person was reading, like you know, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Chronicles of Narnia, the Red Wall series, like all all the classic uh, historical um, fact fiction. Um, but yeah, it's sad. But yeah, maybe when your book comes out, that might give me the the jump that I need <laughs> to read fiction again. Uh- I mean, what you're saying is so familiar to me. I um, I was a massive bookworm when I was growing up. Uh, all of those series you mentioned, I devoured all of them. And um, yeah, and I, I loved reading. I absolutely loved reading. And then, yeah, in the last in the last few years, it it, it definitely tapered off. I read kind of easy reading stuff. Because, mm. like you say, my brain was just so tired of academic reading and mm. and I just didn't want to use it anymore <laughs> so yeah. I was reading really easy easy to digest books and um, actually since so in the last year I mean I started like a little Goodreads challenge so last mm. year I read 30 something books and this year already I've read 12 so this ecofiction obsession has massively skyrocketed my reading and it's it's helped me so much during this whole pandemic because Mm. it has replaced a lot of the time that I would have spent like doom scrolling on Twitter (laughs) and Twitter is such a terrifying place now Mm. um so I've yeah I think I've I've dedicated a lot of time to reading in the last year which has helped me keep my sanity a little bit (laughs) um so yeah, I, I completely understand. And that's one of the things that a lot of people say when they hear about ecofiction. They're like, but you know, those th- these topics like climate change and, and um, extinction and, and things, those are depressing topics. Why on earth would I want to read about them in my spare time? My, mm. my spare time reading is for escapism. It's I want to forget. Um, and I completely understand that. That's, that's so reasonable. Um, but I find that often seeing my own kind of frustrations and my own worries and um, my own eco grief reflected on the on the page of of a book in somebody else's words, in words that I I might not have been able to formulate myself, um, hmm. I find that very therapeutic actually. So in a way, because they're topics that I know need to be talked about but I don't necessarily want to talk about them because they're so depressing. Hmm. Um, I find it very cathartic to read ecofiction and to digest it that way and to cope with some of this um, this eco-grief and eco-anxiety that way. Can you define eco-grief uh, to people that don't oh, yeah, know what exactly. it is? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's something that's it's kind of a newish phenomena in the in the last few years Hmm. um and it's recognized by therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists um they're treating people for eco grief and eco anxiety this is kind of an existential anxiousness about what is going to happen to our world to our way of life because of things like climate change and because of our impact on our planet Hmm. so because so many of these changes are um, predicted to happen in our lifetime, they, you know, directly affect us, and they're directly going to affect the lives of our children, and like they're in our immediate future. Hmm. Um, and for a lot of people, that kind of fear is debilitating, and um, and they can't cope with it. They don't know how to express it because it's not a tangible thing it's this hyper object of climate change it's so big that you can't really comprehend all of it you have to like digest it in slices um 
it's so big that we don't know how to talk about it. We don't know how to deal with it. Mm. Um, and that kind of anxiety that you feel just with the state of the world and um, this kind of lack of hope, I suppose, mm. of things turning around and, and us being able to, um, yeah, reverse some of the damage that we've done. That lack of hope can, can, lead to depression and um and a form of grief because you are losing something you are aware of what we are losing and um yeah it's it's widespread a lot of people are dealing with it and um lack of hope is is demotivating and then you actually mm. don't feel that you can do anything so you don't do anything and as a as a society, if nobody does anything, then yeah, we're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, it's, I would suspect that it's especially, you know, difficult for, for scientists in, in the climate change field and policymakers and, and people who are advising policymakers. I know one of my friends used to, to work at the UN um, in, where was it? Switzerland or Norway. And he was just so, like, it was even closer for him because it wasn't just this thing that was going to happen later on, but he was there kind of um, with the people who are making decisions and, like, always hitting these, like, brick walls where nothing can mm -hmm. even go on, like, on the decision-making level. And, like, he really mm -hmm. got, really got tired of it. It really, like, you know, burnt him out. Um, so, yeah. On the policy level, it, it must be so frustrating. I mean, even, uh, not even, but for, for us scientists, you know, we, we see the evidence. It's so very obvious for us. And then there are still people who are like, oh, I don't really know. And I'm, I don't think that's true. And no, it's not happening. Like, just because it's not happening in their back garden. Um, and we can see that it's true. <laughs> and... Um, that's so frustrating. And also we invest so much of ourselves into our research. So, mm. I mean, specifically conservation researchers, you know, there, there's a lot of love and passion in what they do and to just watch it disappear because people are unwilling to, you know, go for a less convenient life or um, they're unwilling to accept responsibility that their actions do have consequences. Um, yeah, that's that's very frustrating. And it's, it's something that I can't think too hard about because otherwise it, it does get me down. And um, yeah, <laughs> I think if we can reach more people and, and make them feel the emotions that we feel, that can only yeah. be a good thing. For sure. But like, I mean, it also takes a bit of empathy, I suppose, on your side for, for on, on the scientist side for people who are just like living their everyday lives and, you know, just trying to put food on the table. Like life's not necessarily easy for everybody. Um, when you are dealing with something that is okay, we're trying to solve a problem now for a future impact. A lot of people just think like in the next 90 days, like they need to put food on the table tomorrow. And sometimes yeah. it's like not the most ethical way that they can do it, but you know, otherwise they're going to starve. Um, yeah. So it's, it's one of the things I had to come to, to terms with is being empathetic towards everyday people um, still fairly angry towards corporations who like to do the wrong things and try to <laughs> buy them, buy their way out of it, it or, or use their money to influence policy. Um, those are the things I don't really like. Um, but when it comes to people, it's it's difficult. It's it's there's there's entire you know socio economic um, realities and also now research that is to go into that. Like okay, what is the interaction now between the people and the conservation or the sustainability or, or whatever we are trying mm -hmm. to to do? And it's very late that we're trying to understand these things, uh, but yeah. it, it needs to be done. Um, I'm also a bit hopeful <laughs> that there will be technology logical advances that, that that tackle a lot of these things um things like you know renewable energy and then you know getting off 
uh, fossil fuels, which is a thing we should have been able to do a while ago. And I, I think it just we didn't have the political world till I think now it's starting yeah. to get more serious. For sure, absolutely. I mean, conservation is about people. A lot of people, you know, if you think about conservation, you think about the endangered animals that you're trying to protect. But actually, conservation actions are about people because people need to take them. And you're absolutely right that certain, you know, some people who are often blamed for, um, you know, say if if you're a fisherman in an area where there's you know and you catch you catch sharks and you you sell the shark fins however you can to someone who is not seeing the big picture you are often the scapegoat the bad guy when that blame should be going somewhere completely different and mm. um this misplaced blame is a massive problem and the reason is that we don't hear the narratives from these these people's perspectives um mm. they have no other no other option this is their option this is their life and um a lot of conservation is thinking of alternative livelihoods for people who at the moment rely on very finite resources um there's there's a lot of success but it there's you know it doesn't it's not moving as fast as obviously we would like um but i think there's definitely an increase more empathy needed for people who are just trying to get by any way they can and this is the way that you know maybe their their parents lived and this is the way their culture has always survived um and now they need to make a change because we tell them they have to make a change i mean that's also it's not always an easy situation so definitely more more empathy and yeah it would be nice if some of the slack were picked up by the people who could afford to do so mm -hmm. um and if that money was not just thrown away on other things <laughs> <laughs> for sure so you've just i think in the past year or so published um academically your your, your phd findings mm -hmm. um so what i would like to know is what are some of the like, key differences there is between like writing for academia versus writing for fiction and maths you know public marketing Oh, I think it could not be more different. <laughs> <laughs> um, writing for academia. I mean, yeah, so my first published paper came out last November. I think it's just been officially like in a volume in the last couple of weeks. That was very exciting. But yeah, the type of writing is completely different because you're assuming a much different le level of foundational knowledge and base knowledge. So if mm. I'm speaking to another you know, you're you're a you're a fish ecologist, right? You're a fish researcher. So I can yeah. speak to you about certain scientific concepts and even, you know, specifically about fish or about maybe population ecology, things and I could assume that you know a certain base level of information. And therefore when we write journal articles, we don't explain everything from base concepts. Mm. We go in with the jargon we go in with the field specific language that makes mm. absolutely no sense to anyone outside of that field <laughs> um and kind of the more technical it sounds the better it sounds i don't know why that's a thing <laughs> but um often i'll read a paper and i will not i'll have to read a sentence two or three times because the words are just they're so technical and they're mm. they're not even trying to make it readable um yeah whereas it's... if i were to write like that and then try and publish a, a book like a novel that people were going to read no one would read it because it, that's not fun there's no <laughs> that's not fun to read um yeah. Yeah. so and and when you're writing fiction and you're trying to communicate science to a person who has you know their expertise lie elsewhere and um they didn't they didn't study biology maybe and um they have no idea what you're talking about and you still want them to enjoy your book and you still want them to learn something you have to disguise these these scientific concepts and in in little like digestible pieces 
and leave out all of the jargon and all of the detail that's not necessary um, to just convey the main concepts and the main applications or um, purposes for certain things. And then, you know, you have a chance that they're going to retain some of that. But I think if I try to put any anything like the detail or um, technical language in my fictional writing that I did for my academic writing, just, it would not be well received. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it comes down to like, I mean, s- stories usually have like pacing, you know, and, and, and characters developing yeah. and, and scenes being described very like, elegantly trying to it tries to make a picture in your mind whereas a a research paper is just like it's one speed and that speed is fast (laughs) you need to be like (laughs) it needs to be concise you need to use as little wordage as possible because you also have word counts limits and you have to you know get your message across in as a lot of them are quite short and Mm. um you know, we could ramble for hours about what we do, but we have to cut it down to a certain page limit or word limit. And so, yeah, things get things get quite um, succinct. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's conciseness is like one of the number one things you get taught in ac- in academic writing. Yeah. Like, and flowery be- writing yeah. is the worst thing you can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I was taught: don't. This is too flowery. Sure. Cut that out. You don't need that. I'm like, but. Yeah. But that's what makes it readable. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but it's yeah. There's just like certain like tenets you have to hit with with academic writing. Like it has, it has to be like reproducible. It needs to be understandable, but yeah. also you needs to be concise enough that it's not taking too many pages because apparently it's expensive to publish, even though a lot of things are published online these days. Um, yeah yeah so. well that's that's a really good point that reproducibility i mean you need yeah the, the reason we have detail in there is because your research is supposed to be reproducible so somebody should be able to take your article and do exactly what you did and get the results that you got um and if you don't have enough detail in there then that's not possible so it, it has a place detail and all of this language has a place um in academia because you're reading it for a different purpose Mm. i think um yeah and yeah this expensive to publish in academic journals there's a huge there's actually quite a big conversation happening about that right now um Mm. how much you have to pay to publish in a certain journal and um it's a it's an ethical issue yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's a very ethical issue like i've had some other researchers um, on and especially i think it was francois and he was like it's it's unethical because this is information that was first generated through like taxpayer money like like everybody paid for it in order to to make the um the research possible but now you pay gating the uh the final bits and the important bits and it's i also am not very uh, like I, I don't think it's a good idea to do that sort of thing they should have found a different model and there is open access journals and and open access and there, stuff, but yeah there are open access journals there's so not enough of them there's right. there there are a few and and i do try and kind of focus on those um you know, in the future, when I I start another project for kind of communicating um, scientific advancement, scientific journals in fiction form, which is something that I do want to do, mm-hmm. um, I'm only going to be using open access journals because I want people to then be able to, oh, that was really interesting. I think I want to read more <laughs> about that. I want them yeah. to be able to read the paper. Yeah. Um, and not to have reproduce to pay. what you uh, did without paying anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, uh, open access is is um, hopefully on the up and up. <laughs> yeah, let's hope. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Well, why don't you explain a bit about your, your PhD research? You, you delved a bit into it, but essentially, from what I understand, you are modeling 
uh, movement pathways of, of certain animals in aquatic ecosystems. Um, why is something like that important and how do you do it? Oh, <laughs> that's my entire PhD. <laughs> you want me to answer right now. Um, in two sentences. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> concise. Um, so, okay. Dispersal is the movement away from where an organism is born to where it settles to reproduce. Mm. So that kind of movement um, happens in every ecosystem. And in... I'm going to talk about marine ecosystems because that's what's in my head. Mm. Um, if you imagine a coral, um, a coral reef, uh, when they spawn, you you get these little polyps that that float up, and then they get swept up by the currents and they get transported somewhere, where they then settle to create a new coral reef that then grows and um, spawns and and does the whole process mm. over again. So. That process is what I'm trying to model. Mm. So my model includes hydrodynamics, it includes temperature, it includes, um, well, I mean, coral is a completely passive uh, disperser, but other animals, while they develop in the water column, they, you know, develop higher ability to, to swim, so they can influence their direction a little bit more. Mm. And then they can also um, sense suitable habitat around them so they can then try and swim in that direction so some of them will swim towards chemical cues of um, others of their species so if they you know detect a gathering of conspecifics in a nearby mm -hmm. area then they'll then they'll try and move there so that they can settle because a lot of these organisms once they settle, they can't move again. So if they don't settle somewhere where they can reproduce, then they just it, then they'll never reproduce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so evolutionarily, that is one of the purposes for um, these kind of detection methods. Mm -hmm. So my model has kind of a range of behaviors and um, dependencies on currents and things, so that you can predict where if you release individuals from point a where are those individuals going to end up and um and if you have a whole set of patches or or points that you're interested in you can kind of look at the connectivity between those sites and um and if you look at that as a whole population as one unit then you can look at kind of how viable that population is under certain environmental stress. Mm. So if you change the temperature, then maybe development happens a little bit differently. Um, if you, you know, for networks of protected areas, you might have um, some high mortality in the spaces between the protected sites because mm. there's a lot of fishing pressure. So then this all affects dispersal and that all affects kind of the health of the overall population. So that's kind of why this is important um, because, you know, the way that we're exploiting the marine environment at the moment, there's a lot of harvest um, pressure, a lot of f fishing. Um, mm. and unsustainable fishing in, in many cases. And there's a lot of habitat degradation because of fishing methods. Um, and there's, yeah. So we want to know how that affects the populations. How do we manage the stocks to be sustainable so they don't crash? Mm. And also under climate change, where are they going to go? Because a lot of them are going to have to move because the temperature is no longer... Um, is no no longer optimal for them mm. um, and so maybe our protective our sites that are there now are no longer um useful they're no longer protecting them because they're actually having to move out of the protected sites um, so those are some of the just some of the applications that was more than two sentences sorry <laughs> <laughs> no for sure i knew you had to go more than two that would have been impossible <laughs> uh, but yeah I've, I've done like a little but I suppose of each of that work that's that's involved, um, I think one of the things that's the closest is I helped finish up a paper from a previous uh, postdoc for my supervisor that um, looked at sardine, uh, no, it was anchovy. So we were modeling um, anchovies 
in relation to the environment. But also we looked at this big pollution spill that happened like further up the coast of these plastic nurdles, which are like tiny like plastic beads that you use to create mm. um, other plastic products with. Um, that then floated out of the harbor and down the coast. And we use that to kind of see how fast like um, other things that float, would be, which would be like, you know, planktonic stages or, or very, mm -hmm. very tiny baby uh, fish and, and uh, insects, uh, not insects, geez, uh, other <laughs> in, invertebrates. Eggs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, invertebrates and yeah, uh, fish eggs and stuff. And, and the early stages of larvae, which are, which do float. Um, and yeah, well, we basically found that it was a very rapid, you know, movement close, close to the coast. And we modeled it mm -hmm. based on like uh, ocean, ocean geographic, oceanographic features. <laughs> Jeez, I've written that word so many times, but I don't think I've ever said it so many <laughs> Uh, I always, I always stumble over, <laughs> over that. I never know where the emphasis is. <laughs> yeah, oceanographic um, features, yeah. yeah. And right, right now I'm looking at what attracts um, larval fish to their nursery areas. So okay, I suppose, that's cool. I suppose we we do overlap in research in some ways. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. This, that's. I mean, that's kind of the hope for my project that it will be applicable to a lot of different um, areas. So I've already had someone be really interested to use it on um, the Great Lakes because they've got some invasive species. So invasive species is another big one. Um, you know, they're expanding their range all the time. And if you can predict the range expansion of invasive species, then you can potentially stop that range expansion and you can <laughs> contain it so so that they don't outcompete the um the native species too much and um yeah absolutely the movement of plastic particles is a is quite a common one and for oil spills as well um some of these hydro hydrodynamic kind of biophysical models hmm. um they if you assume a, pla a passive particle then it's it doesn't matter whether that particle is a coral polyp or a piece of plastic mm -hmm. um, you just want to know where it goes and a lot of that has been has been done for um kind of the movement of of plastic and and oil spills by uh by ocean currents that's yeah. really interesting stuff it's kind of a, a positive that you can get out of a massive pollution event <laughs> <laughs> these well, things. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> however, however small, so you gotta take the small victories. Oh, yeah, you gotta hang on to the silver linings. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you actually gravitate towards doing uh marine biology as a as a field of, of work? Where did that spark come from? I grew up in California. <laughs> so okay? I went to yeah, I went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium a lot when I was growing up and okay. I loved it i'm not i'm not always a fan of aquaria i i think they need to be done well and um and monterey bay aquarium is one of these one of the the ones that i think have done it quite yeah. well and um and i could sit for hours in front of their kelp forest exhibit and just watch and um mm. i was fascinated i've wanted to be a marine biologist since i was like seven <laughs> um and i love the ocean i just always have so it's not a very original answer but it's just i love the ocean <laughs> and um and there were a lot of kind of marine influences in my life i suppose mm. um so yeah i've always wanted to be a marine biologist i studied marine zoology as an undergraduate and then i i worked for a year in the philippines doing whale shark research and um we put some tags on the whale sharks to to find their movements, and that's how I got into coding because those data sets are massive. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of that's how I got into coding. And now somehow I sit at a desk all day and I haven't been in the field in years. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not really sure how that happened, but yeah. I'm just approaching marine biology in a in a different way, theoretical <laughs> marine biologist. Yeah, 
I mean, me as well. Uh, like, I got hooked onto marine biology by watching like all of these like whaling documentaries, not whaling, but like whale documentaries and mm-hmm. looking at dolphins and stuff. But I ended up mostly doing physiological work, which is you work with aquariums essentially. You, you bring back specimens that you catch mm-hmm. out in the field and you. You shove them in the tank and you torture them in the name of science um, <laughs> and you find out how they respond to things um, yeah and those are the things that go in my model so I'm very grateful that you do that <laughs> so, happy, yeah, happy to help empirical work is the thing that yeah. I use to parameterize my models that's cool so because you started content creation and, and working with YouTube and um, I suppose you were uh, using Twitter in kind of an academic way, but now it's obviously it's part of your branding and marketing. And now you've got a Discord channel to to create a community around that. So you are trying to keep up with, with you know, the latest in, in science communication in general. That's the feeling I get. Um, so what do you think are the ways, you know, we can improve, uh, ways that sounds communication is going to change going forward? Do you have any forward thinking thoughts on the future? <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I don't know if they're forward thinking thoughts. I'm, I'm definitely not the only one having these thoughts. There's a huge, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, there's a huge push in the science community science communications community at the moment um, to incorporate more storytelling into SciCom Mm. Um, because people you know throw as many facts at them as you like they're not going to engage as much as if you tell a story Mm. people like stories we are a storytelling species and I think um, I mean I I am biased I really like this the medium (laughs) of storytelling for science Mm. communication but um, you see it everywhere. You see it in the f- in, in photography and in documentary making. They're all trying to tell a story um, for people to connect to. So I think we're going to see a massive um, shift, and even more of a shift than there already is towards um, narratives and storytelling. Um, I think gamification also, there are a number of video games that already um, address a lot of these issues and they try and encourage the players to work cooperatively and to be aware of kind of finite resources Mm -hmm. and um, to act not only in self-interest but also in kind of longevity's (laughs) interest. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, game games video games are a humongous um industry you know there there are video games that have the same budget as like huge films that go to the cinema i mean Hmm. it's it's crazy um and so i think gamification is going to be massive um you see it in a lot more films as soon as hollywood jumps on that train they're you know the whole point is normalizing talking about a lot of these topics and if you see it in the media that you consume whether that is books or films or video games or anything else if it becomes normal and people kind of assimilate it into their 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 definition of life <laughs> mm. then it'll be so much easier to influence kind of behavior so yeah, I think storytelling is going to be at the heart of it. For sure. Um, so leading leading into that, because I mean you're both involved in research and science communication. If you could have uh, reasonably high, almost infinite resources, um, which is probably time and money. <laughs> Well, what kind of <laughs> what kind of large scale like research projects or psychon projects would you like to be like the head of? Oh well, I do I do actually have an answer for that. Um, in terms of the psychon project, eventually, again, given the given the conditions that I have as much money as I need Mm. and opportunity and time Mm. um, I would love to set up kind of a 
<laughs> take a step back. There's a there's an organization called Photographers Without Borders who send professional photographers to conservation NGOs who don't mm-hmm. have money to um, take professional level photos for their social media and their kind of marketing campaigns. Mm, so cool. this organization mm-hmm. sends photographers out to to volunteer with these um, NGOs, take pictures for them so that they can use it to um, get more attention, more awareness, more donations to keep doing the work that they're doing. I want to create something similar for ecofiction, specifically for conservation. Um, I would love to have a group of authors who travel out to conservation NGOs and tell the stories that are not being told from the perspectives that we don't see very often so that you as the reader get to understand the situation as it actually is um, and that it's not as simple as we might think and I would yeah that is my dream of what I would do with ecofiction and if once I once I make enough um author friends maybe i can get them to, <laughs> yeah. to go out and travel i mean travel i think the authors would write. be quite willing because they would you know travel to these beautiful places um yeah. and then they would write they would write a book and they would tell that story and then the proceeds from that book would go to um supporting that's the word yeah. supporting that um conservation NGO and of course that's where the money comes in because these authors would then make very little money off of it it would be mm-hmm. a voluntary act and I would have to send them to all these places yeah, yeah. which of course they would not pay for so yeah. I would need money to send people all around the world <laughs> sure that sounds pretty cool I, I I never thought of something like that for for writing because I knew about like Doctors Without Borders um, mm-hmm. And maybe a couple of others. This is the first time I'm writing about ph- photographers with our borders. I need to check that out. Um, but it is something that, yeah, it would be really cool if, like, if, if you were, you know, just after studying writing or writing for a bit, you know, you get opportunity to travel and, uh, you know, do some good in the world and get inspiration for for more future books. It seems like a win-win for everybody, except whoever's paying for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this would be, you know, that like, urge that everyone has to do something that makes a difference it sounds very cheesy mm. but of course mm. we you know that's something that we all kind of want you know mm. and um this would be something that would be fulfilling i think for me that it would that i would feel that i was that i was doing my own form of activism because mm. um i'm not comfortable with all forms of activism i'm a, quite mm. a shy person but mm. i'm you know I am comfortable with this. So if this is something that I can do to put the message out there and get more people involved and connected and spread whatever word I want to spread, mm. then mm. I, I see that as activism. Mm. Are you only interested in in writing for in, in book form? Or would you... Can you also see yourself writing scripts or writing a story for a video game or poetry or music or anything like that? Uh, Poetry, I think, is a long reach for me. For some reason, (laughs) I don't think in poems. I would love to. I would love to. um, And I think it's something that I have to actively get into, um, which eventually one day I will. (laughs) Mm. Um, I am. This other project that I mentioned briefly is kind of a. A serial, it's an episodic series. Um, so if you think of sh- TV shows like CSI, where it's very um, every, you can watch one episode standalone. It's not mm. kind of a chunk of, an, of a bigger story. Mm. It's, mm. it's very self-contained. Um, that kind of format is what I want to use to um, bring new conservation science to the public so i find a paper i like i put the gist of that paper into a story and i 
and I write it and I put it out there. So that is something that is going to be happening. Um, so that's a different format. That's not book. That would be kind of a shorter version, maybe novella length. Short stories I've been thinking about. I don't know if I want to get into television or anything. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> um, if the opportunity arises, maybe. But I think for now, I'll, I'll stick to <laughs> I'll stick to readers <laughs> as my audience. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I suppose, like, yeah, if if you get. The, the opportunity would be cool to, to take it, but you're not actively like searching for for other forms, which is, I mean, that, that's fine. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. I um, think I have my hands full with this for now. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Doing anything else outside of academia is having your hands full. Like <laughs> It really is, but it's also so important. I think I've gotten so much out of having hobbies that are not my PhD. Because mm. otherwise your PhD can become so all-consuming. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's healthy to have something outside of academia. <laughs> For sure. It, it's, it is, it takes a lot of mental energy. It does. Um, and you have to find ways of recharging it. Um, For sure. For sure. Otherwise you will just break down <laughs> into a puddle. <laughs> yeah. Into a puddle of academic sadness. Um, oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> I suppose oh, it's so true, but so sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like the meme is like, how can you how can you say something so controversial and true at the same time? <laughs> so that was. I know. <laughs> how dare you call me out like that? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. Uh, but it is. Uh, oh. I mean, that's why we do all this other types of stuff. Um, I actually like I I wouldn't say this is like total fiction writing but I'm a what you would call a dungeon master and I oh, run cool. yeah. so I mean do you know about D&D? Yeah, so yeah, D&D absolutely. Um I've heard I've heard a lot about D&D. So you haven't tried it yet. Uh, are you going to I try it? I haven't. No, I'm are you curious? I'm a little overwhelmed <laughs> <laughs> to try it, but yeah. um, I know eventually I'm going to have to. But um, yeah, I've heard I, a lot of thought about it. I would say that dungeon mastering is kind of like a a very, very, very artisanal form of like science writer um, because you do have to kind of plot out these scenarios for your your players and you have to plot out a bit of story if you're doing especially a homebrew world you have to create a world it's, it's world building mm -hmm. as well um and i think yeah. that some of the principles might apply to you know fiction writing and i try as well to put ecological you know principles and, and conservation and stuff into my storytelling where i can um there's a there's a podcast that does it really well they're called dugongs and sea dragons and they have essentially a, a marine biology based um D, D podcast with a bunch of like professors um, which is which is really cool and it's also a, a, a kind of form of science communication that's what they're in, intending it as but it's also okay. has storytelling built in as well as mm -hmm. as gameplay and i think it's probably one of the most interesting ways to to communicate science that uh, i think more people should try uh, yeah no i have i have heard this podcast i've been following this podcast it's so mm. much fun yeah this is exactly what i mean with engaging in all the different types of media that people consume yeah i think i think it's a really really clever way of getting people to engage with something because you can make that cool you can make a really cool marine biology based dungeons and dragons campaign mm -hmm. you really could and For um, sure. well, i mean what? have you have you heard of the world building platform called world anvil i have yeah i i, I tried yeah. using it for a bit it was i didn't know whether i want to port everything that i have on there <laughs> Uh, cause I, all of my like world building is all in like Google, um, sheets. 
Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's how I share with my players. You know, you can send them like a Google Sheets link if, if you want them to to see a particular aspect. But I do see the Bears of World Anvil. Maybe I will port over the time. It's just gonna take like a few, like maybe a week to do that. I don't know when they have that yeah, time. Yeah. They, so, they have so many resources for it as well. But yeah. my, my point was, I mean, they do it for writers and they do it for, um, like, their main for audiences dungeon masters, are, yeah. are writers and for Dungeon Masters. Yeah. <laughs> because you the, need it. the principles are the same. World building yeah. principles are the same. Yeah. And um, you still need to make it fun and engaging and yeah. interesting. and um, And, you know as developed as it needs to be to feel real so that your your player or your reader can suspend disbelief (laughs) for a little while so the principles are exactly the same what's one obscure tip you would give any dutch master trying to include um, ecology or conservation into their story oh that's a very good question um I mean, you have the standard, like, gripes that people have with, um, you know, dragons. They shouldn't Mm. actually be that size and be able to fly, that kind of thing. (laughs) If you wanted to be science-based about it and you were going to look at, you know, the gravity of your planet and the weight of a dragon and how dense they are and and things. Um, I would look for... Oh, here we go. My obscure tip is to look up... um, the podcast called Exo Lore. It's um, run by Moya McTeer, who is an astrophysicist and folklorist. And she does a podcast where she invites um, experts from all different kinds of fields, like not even just scientific, but all kinds. And mm-hmm. they take an exoplanet, so a planet outside of our solar system, and um, and they world build it. They say, okay, well, this planet gets a lot of asteroid strikes. What kind of culture, what kind of species would evolve on this planet? And, um, and they world build that way. And they go into culture, they go into biology, they go into music and food and what science they would emphasize and things like mm. that. It's so interesting. And on her YouTube channel, she does... Um, reverse world building so she takes the dragon and she world builds the world that would have led to the evolution of the dragon and Mm. she takes vampires and she did one for pikachu i think so like that i think is is so interesting if you take something and you and you look for scientific reasons why that would be you can make something mm. really cool because then that could actually affect the rest of the world that you're building. Mm. Um, I think for the dragons, she had something that they ate fool's gold or or something, and that's how they would be able to breathe fire. So she had to create a world where fool's gold was plentiful think, and yeah. all of these different <laughs> things. And it was yeah. just a very cool, very cool. So that is my obscure resource tip. Go and go and watch yeah. and listen to Exolore. It's for a some really, really good one. Over. I wasn't aware of this one, so thank you. There you go. <laughs> I need to go check Mario it out. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think we've done about an hour now, so it's it's time to wrap up. I'm I'm glad we're wrapping up on kind of a upside because it got dark a couple of times. So it did get dark. It did <laughs> get dark. <laughs> the past These hour. conversations tend to get dark, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't know how to avoid it, but it is good that we. We're back yeah, on the, we on we the come back up. Yeah, we're back on the yeah, upside. We've resurfaced. <laughs> so why don't you let a lovely audience know where they can find you and your work on the internet? Okay. Um, well, you can find me on my YouTube channel, Ecofictology. I post videos every Wednesday, and sometimes there's some bonus content on Mondays. Um, I talk about reading and writing ecofiction in a nutshell, and how you can use it for science communication. Um, you can also find me at Gaia Lovis um, on Twitter. You can find me at Lovis Gaia on Instagram. I don't know why Twitter switched it. Don't ask me. <laughs> um, it was an accident and now I can't change it. <laughs> oh, um, um, where else can you find me? 
Yeah, those are the main places. Those are the main three places for now. I don't have a website yet, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> one day is one day. Yeah, and thank one you. Day, one day. <laughs> thank you, Lovers, for joining me. It's a really fun chat. And uh, thank everyone at home for listening. It's been uh, a really good few. This is the 22nd episode. Uh, about a half a year of uh, chatting to interesting people doing interesting things in the science communication space um so do join do subscribe do follow do like do rate do whatever you have to <laughs> in order to get access to more of these as we as we continue uh going down the science of geekoscopy <laughs> so yeah thanks like. Lewis, and cheers thanks for having me